Can we start with the Surah Al-Fatiha, please? أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الصلاة والسلام على محمد وعليه الطيبين الطاهرين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته I'm going to start looking today at an awesome woman a woman who I can't describe her better than that she's absolutely awesome so let's look at her I'm going to look first at her life before I focus on her heritage. And I see her heritage in two parts. One is Majalis, which I look at as an intellectual heritage on her part. And the next is her trust in divinity. But before that, for the benefit of the younger people, a little bit of a timeline look at her life and see who she was. Very often, we only know her for the two years between the day of Ashura and the time of her wafat. You've got a timeline in front of you, and maybe we'll quickly go over it so we know who she was. So born in five after Hijra to Imam Ali and Sayyidah Fatima, named by the Prophet as Zainab, which means the beauty of her father. And he said, I enjoin you to honor this child, for she resembles Khadija. Her grandfather and mother died at the, die at the age of seven. She gets married at the age of 12 to someone who is known as the first Muslim born in Africa, who is Abdullah ibn Jafar Tayyar. Just a little bit about, about um, his parents. Abdullah's parents were Jafar, and most of us know Jafar as the brother of Imam Ali al-Islam, who was killed in the Battle of Mu'ta. He's buried in Jordan. And he is known as Jafar Tayyar because just like, just like Hazrat Abbas al-Islam, his arms were severed. And when the Prophet comes to give condolences to his wife, um, Asma bint Umais, he tells her that he, is, he has the, the wings metaphorically as such. Asma, his mother, Abdullah's mother, um, on the martyrdom of uh, Hazrat Jafar, then marries Abu Bakr. And she has a son called Muhammad. When Abu Bakr dies, she marries Imam Ali, and she brings this son called Muhammad in the house of Imam Ali al-Islam. And they have two children. They have Yahya, and they have On. Now, the reason for me telling you all this is that the prejudices we have did not exist at that time. Um, Asma was also, say, the Fatima's best friend. And you find this narrated at the time of the wafat of, say, the Fatima, when she tells Asma that one thing that I don't like is for everybody to be able to see my, my body um, when I, or the shape of my body when I'll be buried. And Asma says, you know, when we went to, when we went to the Hijra to Ethiopia, they had a certain sort of uh, construction in which they buried their dead. And this is what we see as janaza, where you have the wooden, um, wooden structures that are done. And this is the same Asma, who is the mother-in-law of Sayyid Zainab. That's a little bit of preamble there. Um, they were blessed with five sons and a daughter. Most of, most of us only know Own and Muhammad. Well, there was a Muhammad al-Akbar who was killed in the Battle of Sifin. There was Own, as we know, and Muhammad al-Asker. And we had Ali Abbas and Umm Kulthum. Some narrations say they had nine sons. So good to read up. If you turn the page or still look at the timeline that you've got in front of you, you'll also find that one of the things she does is that when Imam Ali al-Islam moves to Kufa, she moves as a family as well. And this was part of her mahar as such. There was a condition which said, when Hussein goes anywhere, I will go with him. So she moves to Kufa when she's about 32. She comes back to Medina when she's 35. This is after Imam Ali al-Islam is martyred in the mosque of Kufa. We find from the age, from then on, or rather until the age of 55, she leads a life where she's raising a family, she's educated the women in the community in Medina, and she's supporting her brother through various different phases. For example, we're told that maybe um, Um Layla was not present, or rather she died soon after the birth of Ali al-Akbar, and he was raised by Sayyidah Zainab. 
we find she looked after that whole family as such. And if I may put this to you, the Zainab that you find before Ashura and the Zainab we find after Ashura are two completely different personalities. The Zainab before Ashura is the mother, the daughter, the wife, the teacher. I, I, I will not say ordinary, but really something that didn't, didn't stand out as somebody who, well, somebody who didn't actually stand out was exceptional. She was, but the exceptional part of her life was yet to manifest itself. And you find somehow, as soon as the day of Ashura happens, as soon as the martyrdom of Imam Hussein happens, there's another Zainab that emerges, a Zainab that was prepared up to those 55 years. The intellect and the courage just sort of manifested itself. And I'd like to put it to you that that is probably because she had protectors. The men in her family always protected her. They were there always as a source of, if I can say, her mountain. But when her mountains crumbled, when they were killed, suddenly another Zainab emerged. Now we find a Zainab who is completely different. We find her standing up and being able to speak in the court of Yazid, where this same Zainab was so bewildered um, in Karbala that when they got to the land of Karbala, she says, I don't feel right here. And she actually faints. She, this was a Zainab before. Suddenly after, there is Ibn Ziyad who's asking her, and you will recite this in the Ziyarat, you find this in the Ziyarat, where he asks her, how did you find the way Allah treated your brother and his family? And she says, you know what? I saw nothing but beauty. Ma ra'ayta illa jamila, she says. Amazing woman. She suddenly comes out with, with something exceptional. Now we find um, that, as I mentioned in the beginning, that what we're going to look at today is her legacy. And we find that what she has left behind is an absolutely awesome legacy. None of us would be sitting here we'd probably just have masjids where we'd go and pray and come out, and we'd have little circles where we'd discuss things in little homes. We would not have today what we have, Imam Bargas and Husseiniyas and centers, and we wouldn't even have a salam center in the making if it wasn't for the personality of Sayyidah Zainab. So I'm going to just explain a few things the way I understand it, so it's simple. Um, first of all, when I say intellectual heritage as such, um, I will use the term intellectual to translate the Arabic word akl. And by Islamic intellectual heritage, it is those ideas and thoughts which cause a revolution in the souls of people which takes them closer to the divine. In other words, towards their full potential. If you look at the history of Islamic inte intellectuality, if you can call it that, it's, it's actually embodied in so many different forms. You find Muslims over time have attempted to think rightly and correctly. And the intellectual tradition is quite lively. We're so many disagreements which are good because that's how we're progressing. But you will find in absolutely every school of thought, one principle is agreed by everyone. And that's the principle that there is one God. And that's he's the source of truth and reality. He's the origin of everything. And to think Islamically is to recognize that unity and draw the consequences from that unity. Now, she was clever. She was very, very intelligent. Because she knew this. And she also knew that the sacrifice of Imam Hussein on the plains of Karbala would invoke a thought process in any thinking human being. Because people would think, was the difference of opinion concerning Allah, because both sides were the followers of one God and the same messenger. There was no difference between them. So was the difference so catastrophic that it resulted where one side of Muslims actually lost their humanity? It makes everybody think. You don't have to have rocket science, have a degree in anything to think like that. And she thought like that too. So let's see what she did. First of all, no sacrifice is complete without the transmission of its message. And if I look at Imam, he had a two-man team or two-person team. He needed someone to watch his back. He needed to ensure that the message of Tawheed lived in its true sense. 
And for his marketing director, for Truth, he picked a woman. And I think, why did you do that? Because this is an era where the, the hierarchies are dominated by men. And forgive me for saying this to this side, men can be bullies, right? Through time, if allowed, they can. So can women, I guess, but hey, they've got a better way of doing it. So, <laughs> so in this time, when there were despotic male-dominated hierarchies, he picks her. And he says, you know what? This is your job. And she's known as Sharikatul Hussein. And I think she must have been the greatest psychiatrist that God created. Because she got the job done in an absolutely awesome way. So what does she do? On the return of the prisoners to Medina, when, when they're freed from, from um, prison, she asks for this little place where she can talk where she can talk about what happened in Karbala. And we call this majlis. In its, in its technical sense, a majlis is a meeting, a session, or a gathering. And I think there's only one reference in the Quran. You'll find it in Surah number 58, Ayah 11, where Allah says, ya fil fil um, When it is said to you, make room in your gatherings, then make room because Allah will give you ample. Now, the history behind that is when the Ahl al-Sufa used to sit um, outside, and you know, these were the, the refugees as such, and the Prophet used to go and sit with them and talk. It was a majlis, and he used to talk to them, and they used to crowd around him. And one day, Qais ibn Thabit, who was a scholar and a warrior, walks in, and nobody moves. It is just um, etiquette that when a scholar of that caliber walked in, then somebody would make space or get up, and we do that too. Yet nobody did, and this eye of Quran was revealed. So that's, that's the reference in, in Quran, by the way. In reference to Imam Hussain al-Islam, it is this gathering to remember the message, just as say the Zainab did. Even when she returned to Medina, she made Majalis a standpoint in the city, so much so, that you found that um, there was a revulsion against the oppressors as such. And Amr ibn Sa'ad ibn al-As was the governor of Medina. And he writes to Yazid and he says, you know what, she can't stay here. You have to exile her. That's why you find that she leaves Medina. And whether she went to Damascus or she went to Cairo, we don't know. And we don't know where she actually died. So let's just look a little bit at this concept of majalis. And it has now evolved into a sitting where there are some intellectual thought, thoughts in motion. She made this a symbol to distinguish between right and wrong, the oppressed and the oppressor, truth and falsehood. But the clever side of this was that it wasn't just an ordinary discussion place. It wasn't a place just to sit down and talk, because these were happening everywhere. And where you have a school or a college or a place where people discuss ideas or cafes, as they were in France, um, you don't get everybody in. She enticed them with emotion. And the emotion was Hussein. Because even if you didn't understand anything, even if you didn't want to come to learn, something drew you to this farsh, as they call it. She knew that would draw them, and what drew them was Hussein. Um, the public demonstrations of grief that first occurred were in about 961 CE or 351 after Hijra. You found on the 10th of Muharram, there was a spontaneous procession in the streets of Baghdad, and loads of people came out saying, Ya Hussein. Um, in the same year, the same sort of procession took place in Egypt, and you found then from there on, every culture developed a mode of majlis, and majlises were done differently. The Taimur Lang, for example, the Mongols, he introduced tabut and alam. Um, when he went to the subcontinent, the medium changed a little bit. You found, uh, for example, in Iran, they had passion plays. The processions in India were so famous, or rather they were so um, 
if I can say, so enthralling to people, people were drawn to them, that you even had the Hindus coming. The Maharajas of Gwalior was seen walking behind the Alam of Hazrat Abbas barefooted without any insignia of his office. It was something that drew everybody along. Everybody had something they could identify with when they looked at um, the event of Karbala. It had political resolve as well, because history reports that Gandhi, on his famous salt march to protest against the oppression of the British, took 72 people with him, and he emulated Imam Hussein's pro protest against Yazid's oppression. So you find this thing moved, this thing that she started, called Majlis, in a small room in Damascus, in the very heart of the oppressor's kingdom. It produced scholars, it produced book writers, it produced poets, all, all different sort of people. It produced buildings like this. This building would not have been here. This is what it did. It even produced biryani for us. We won't be sitting here eating like this, okay? It, it just did all that. Um, some of the things we associate with Majlis, for example, is where you will find in the Arab world, for example, it is sort of the, the narrations of Karbala, the Maktal as such, is narrated in prose. Now you wonder how that came about. And we have a debate at the moment, oh, should we have prose or should it be a very formal just reciting of the or reading of the book? Or can we add emotion to it? Okay, we can't add our own two pennies worth. It's got to be very, very factual. But how do you present it? Can I just read it? Will it move you when I read it? Do I say the word Hussein and will that move you? Or do I need a little bit of prose in it? And you find... Um, Sheikh Ibn Babawaya Kumi, who's known as Sheikh Saduk, in 300, he died in 381 after Hijra. He's the one who introduced prose as a medium of conveying the message of Hussein. So he would, forgive me for saying this, but I don't like using the word chant, but he would sort of sing it a little. And he would use words that were a little bit poetic in it. And you find his words are preserved in his Amali, uh, the Amali of Sheikh Saduk, which is the dictations of Sheikh Saduk. Now, this revolution of majlis changed the lives of the majlis goer. They really did. And maybe I can put it to you, and I'll move up a little bit, that this institution she set up combats something that maybe we can call as compound ignorance. Very often, we don't know that we don't know. And we think we know. We find this concept in madrasa. Um, once our children have come up to about year eight or year nine, and you tell them, you come to a new year in madrasa and you say, we're going to teach you about salah. They say, we know everything about salah. You tell them, we're going to teach you about the prophet. They say, we did it in year five. And then you come to a majlis, the same thing happens. Because you say, it's exactly the same. Everybody's reading. And we have something in our minds that seems to tell us we know it all. This institution forces us to listen to something and we think, ah, oh, yeah, maybe I didn't know that. So this is what she set up, and I think it's, it's an absolutely awesome thing she did. The second thing she did through this majalis was she gave us the platform to be able to challenge male-dominated hierarchies. Um, it's quite good to be able to sit here and say that men can be bullies, without them standing up and getting upset. Um, her trust in God, absolutely unwavering. I look at her dua to take you there. But maybe the greatest thing this woman had, and which she teaches all women to have, is intellect with courage. Because intellect without courage is weak, and courage without intellect is foolish. I'd like to end with her spiritual side. Because everything in life needs a balance. You may have the intellect, you may have the courage. So you've got your mental sorted out and you've got your physical sorted out and maybe your emotional sorted out. But without the spiritual, nothing works. And I think the way she thought is encompassed in this dua. This is a dua that was taught by Imam Ali al-Islam, recommended to be recited after Salatul Layl. One of the most beautiful duas that exist. As a child, I remember my grandmother um, every time we were stuck with something, she would say, read the dua of Sayyidah Zainab. And you never knew why she um, pushed it so much. But 
when you recite the Torah and you understand what she's trying to say, you know what it means. You've got your booklets. If you turn to page 24, if you can't concentrate on the screen, we'll just go over it and maybe recite it together. So she starts off with Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Wa kam lillahi min lutfin khafi. How many bounties of Allah are concealed? And when I read this, I think of this, this sentence and try and remember it, that when Ibn Ziyad is asking her, how did you find the way Allah treated your brother and his family? Because immediately she says, and I repeat it again, ma ra'ayta illa jamila. I did not see anything but beauty. And I'm thinking, you know what? You saw a battlefield where everybody you loved was killed, slaughtered, not only killed, slaughtered. You were tied, you were, you were treated so badly, yet you're telling me that you saw nothing but goodness. And I think, in my mind, that وَكَمْ لِلَّهِ مِنْ لُطْفٍ خَفِي She saw what was to come. Because she knew she'd done her best, given it up to Allah, which is وَفَوِّذْ وَمْرِ اللَّهِ إِنَّ اللَّهَ بَصِيرٌ بِالْعِبَادِ And she knew whatever would come out would be good. So, يَدُقُّ خَفَاهُ أَنْ فَحْمِ الزَّقِي And it is his understanding is above the heavens and the earth. وَكَمْ يُسْرٍ عَطَى مِنْ بَعْدِ أُسْرَ How many comforts come after trouble? فَفَرِّجْ قُرْبَةَ الْقَلْبِ الشَّجِي And they take away that which hurts the heart. How many things which bring grief in the morning and suddenly you find by evening it turned into joy. And she says, if any time something troubles you, trust in him. And she uses three um, attributes of God. She uses wahid, al-fard, and al-ali. Um, Maybe I should put it here. I'm a koja. And one of the things I do very good is I bare and I bare and I bare, which means I read and I read and I read. And very often I don't think and I don't think and I think and I just read. And you could give me Thursday, do I come well? I don't have to look at the book. I just read. Um, sometimes it's good to ponder over this. And sometimes it's good to look at these asma'ul husna especially the ones that are mentioned in du'as like this, and ponder over each one. I suggest when you're in trouble, if you can't remember the du'a, at least remember that combination, al-wahid al-fard al-ali, and know it will lift you out of things. And then think if you can understand what that ism means. Look at it, as I call it, it's theoethic, it's psychoethic, and it's socioethic. Look at what it means first. Then see how you can apply it to your life. And then does it manifest itself in your life? Because when the Prophet said, تَقَلُّكُ بِأَخْلَاقِ اللَّهِ Adopt in yourself the akhlaq of Allah. He meant study those 99 attributes. Look at them, put them in yourself. Get them part of your psyche and then manifest them. So wahid and fard and ali are awesome attributes that we need to look at. And then she says, تَوَصَّلْ بِالنَّبِي فَقُلُّ خَتْمٌ يَهُونُ إِذَا تَوَصَّلَ بِالنَّبِي Take the wasila of the Prophet because through him, through his intercession, all problems are um, solved. And then finally, she, she ends up by saying, وَلَا تَقْصَى إِذَا مَا نَابَ خَتْمٌ فَكَمْ لِلَّهِ مِنْ لُطْفٍ خَفِي um, So many things, she says, whenever these calamities that fall you and you become restless, all these, all these things, um, you will find that within them there is an action of Allah that is concealed. I love this du'a. I hope you will recite it. I hope you will like it. And maybe just as a final thing, you could turn to page 27, and with me, and loudly please, you will recite the ziyara of Sayyid Zainab. Yes? Thank you. Assalamu alaikum ya bint Rasulillah. Assalamu alaikum ya bint Nabiyillah. Assalamu alaikum ya bint Muhammadin al Mustafa. Assalamu alaikum ya bint Waliyillah. 
السلام عليك يا بنت علي مرتضى سيد أوسياء والصديقين السلام عليك يا بنت فاطمة الزهراء سيدة النساء العالمين السلام عليك يا أخت العسن والحسين سيد شباب أهل الجنة السلام عليك يا أيها السيدة الزقية السلام عليك يا أيتها تعبت الخفية السلام عليك يا أيتها الثقية النكية السلام عليك يا أيتها الراضية المرضية السلام عليك يا أيها العالمة غير المعلمة السلام عليك يا أيتها الفهيمة الغير المفحمة السلام عليك يا أيتها المظلومة السلام عليك يا أيتها المحمومة السلام عليك يا أيها الصديقة السلام عليك يا أيتها المكروبة السلام عليك يا أيتها المعصورة السلام عليك يا أيتها الصاحبة المصيبة العظمى السلام عليك يا زينب القبرة ورحمة الله وبركاته الله do you have any questions? Um, thank you. Um, as is um, customary, we will um, have about 15 minutes of questions and answers. Um, can we start with the ladies if there are any questions? Asalaamu Alaikum. Um, from your book, it says the same year that they went to Karbala returned in the same year. In different hadiths, they said they followed, they came back the following year. Um, which hadith is true or what sort of... Uh, Do you know what? I, I, I look, I, I have exactly the same question that you might have. But the more I read, the more I ask those whom I feel know history better than anybody else, it seems that they came back in the same year. I have references, and maybe you can email me and I'll send them to you. And we actually changed the books to reflect that. Yeah. Do you want to ask something? I see one of the works I while at school. Do you? Um, do the men have any questions? That's awesome. <laughs> They've understood it all. <laughs> it's very clear. Any further questions from the sisters? So I can go back and sit in the comfort of my own. Um. <laughs> One final chance for anyone who has any questions, men or women? Oh, yeah, we have. Why has she got so many titles? Which are not recognized now. She was all those things. These all manifested themselves so beautifully. And I think when she spoke, if you look at them, there she was fluent, she was eloquent, she was intellectual. I think we tried to cover that sort of aspect of her. But I think Zainab encompasses the whole thing. Alima Ghairi Mu'allima. I think that was the title that Imam Zainul Abidin Alayhi Islam granted her. <laughs>